So we're lucky again today to have an external guest speaker. This time, Vivian Susano Medeiros is joining us. Hopefully I didn't butcher that too badly. Um, now, we're all already muted and have our videos off, so we know how this goes. Um, and our speaker has asked that if you have questions during the talk, uh, please do type them into the chat window, but unless it's urgent, we'll likely hold most of the discussion at the end of the talk. So do type into the chat window as we go, uh, and we'll have a discussion following the talk. Um, announcements, we are back to our regular time next week at 1 p.m. with uh, a, an until very recently external speaker now returned to the ACFR. Tim Bailey will share some of his experiences and uh, insights from his last few years of experience outside of the ACFR. But today we have Vivian Susano Medeiros joining us. Uh, Vivian received a master's degree in mechanical engineering in 2015 and a doctoral degree in robotics and control systems uh, this year in 2020 from the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, Puc Rio. So Vivian was a visiting PhD student at the Autonomous Systems Lab at ETH Zurich, as we just heard in our conversation, where she worked on trajectory optimization for uh, the quadrupedal robot, Animal. An animal? Animal? Uh, yes, cleverly, Animal. Cleverly spelled Animal. Okay, uh, and now Vivian is at the Research Center on Inspection Technology, the CPTI in Rio de Janeiro, where she works on embedded control systems for autonomous underwater inspection systems. So very much looking forward to your talk today. Vivian, thank you for joining us at this late hour for you. Uh, please do take it away. So, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. So first of all, uh, I'm very excited to be here. It's an honor, it's a great pleasure to give this talk for you guys. So hopefully you'll find interesting and have uh, a lot of interesting questions. So please ask as many questions as you like. So um, a bit uh, about myself. So there was a quick introduction there. So I have a bachelor's degree in counter and automation engineering from the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro, PUC. Uh, and I had some, yeah, part of my bachelor's degree was also done at Coimbra University. So I took several classes, most of the classes in control systems and mechatronics was taking there what I was uh, studying abroad at the, at the Coimbra University in Portugal. Uh, I also have a master's degree in mechanical engineering from PUC as well, where I work with optimal trajectories on racetracks for Formula One cars. It was a very interesting work, mostly simulations. I didn't have an actual Formula One car to test with, but uh, we managed to get some pretty cool trajectories and compare it with some embedded data obtained from real pilots. So it was very cool. And then I moved on to my PhD, in, also in the mechanical engineering department at PUC with the field of research was robotics and control systems. And I was a visiting PhD student at the Autonomous Systems Lab of Professor Roland Siegward uh, between 2018 and 2018. And uh, a lot of the research and all of the experimental part of the research was done there in a partnership with the Robotic Systems Lab from Professor Marco Hutter. So the title of my thesis that was just defended a couple of months ago, I finished now in August. So it was trajectory optimization for hybrid build legged robots in challenging terrain. So the first part of the talk, most of the talk will be about a brief presentation about the work that was developed during my PhD. And then I reserved some slides at the end to talk about the company that I currently work uh, in, which is the uh, Research Center for Pipeline Inspection Technology. Uh, so we developed inspection systems for several different stru structures in the oil gas field. So hopefully it will be also interesting for some of you. Um, so let's start with the motivation for work. So extensive research has been done in the last few years to safely deploy autonomous mobile robots in different scenarios, right? So we have uh, farming, we have industrial inspection, payload delivery, uh, extraplanetary exploration, and so on. So uh, in a lot of these scenarios, we have 
terrains with obstacles and uh, unstructured environments. So it is important to do the robot can handle rough terrain navigation. Uh, in most of these cases, right, in most of these scenarios, in a lot of these scenarios, uh, the robots use wheeled locomotion. It's uh, easier to control, it's faster and efficient. Um, so in, in general, if we can use wheeled locomotion, it is probably the best way to go. But when we have obstacles, discontinued in the terrain profile, legged locomotion might be more durable because the presence of the legs allow for negotiation of obstacles. So in this scenario, we have wheeled legged robots. This kind of robots offer the temptation to combine both wheeled and legged locomotion systems so they can use the wheels to move faster and more efficiently through continuous terrain and they can use the legs to overcome obstacles along the path, right? Obstacles along the terrain profile. So here we have some examples. There, there is the robot animal from ATH. There, uh, there is also the robot handle that is well known from Boston Dynamics, which is also a wheeled legged robot. And there is also another example here, the walking excavator. Menzimak is also being researched at ATH as well. So it is a hybrid robot because it has large wheels and the wheels are attached to these very large hydraulic actuators that can change the wheels position. So, so it gives this hybrid locomotion system. So there are several existing approaches for locomotion. Uh, regarding wheeled legged systems. So most of the work, the more, more old work, right? The, there's several, a lot of work focusing on statically stable locomotion. So in this case, they, they employ a purely reactive controller and uh, the wheels, the legs act more like an active suspension system. So these are the cases, for instance, of extraplanetary rovers. So they have this hybrid locomotion system where they use mainly the wheels for locomotion, but they use the legs to adapt to terrain variations. So usually they have a desired base position or orientation that they want to keep along the trajectory and then they use the legs to adapt to terrain variations along the way. These all in a quasi-static condition in very low speed. We have other approaches where the robot actually changes its configuration, either to use legs or wheels. Uh, one example is the DRC Hubble robot. It actually has a crunched position where the legs are close together and then the wheels in the mid legs here get in contact with the terrain so we can drive around in flat terrain. And then depending on the scenario, if it has obstacles, it used to the lagged version. We also have other approaches that involve switching between driving and stepping based on the terrain complexity, but it does not involve actual change in the configuration of the robot. So we have the robot Momaro and his successor, the robot Centauro. Uh, these robots, they have, uh, there are several work related to them and they usually um, use also a, a kinematic approach for locomotion. So the motions are performed in a static condition at low speeds and they either use the legs on the wheels, so they have a map of the terrain. So most of the work, they use some kind of map of the terrain where they decide whether to drive around an obstacle or use the legs to walk over it. So there is a video here where the robot actually goes over a gap. And this is four times the speed. So it's, it's a, in a very static maneuver and there is a lot of teleoperation involved. So a lot of these maneuvers are predefined. 
So there is a number of works that focus on loop aversion and a static or quite static condition, employing a purely reactive controller. Uh, for as for dynamic locomotion, we also have some interesting previous work. Uh, we have some wheeled bipedal robots, uh, which is the case for the handle robot that we've seen in the previous slides. There is also there is also the Ascento robot from ETH as well. Uh, these kind of robots usually drive use the wheels to drive over continuous terrain and the legs to jump over obstacles. We have also the Robocinium robot from JPL. Uh, some of you may know this robot as a legged robot, I mean with point feet. There is also a version with passive wheels installed at the end of the legs to become a hybrid system and it has been shown to perform hybrid locomotion using the passive wheels for skating, but mainly on, mostly, I mean, exclusively on flat terrain. And there, also, there is also this uh, very cool framework called skater bots. And they also optimize trajectory for different robot types. So they can use just the wheels or just the legs or combine both wheel and leg locomotion, but also limited to flat terrain applications. Um, one particular robot that we can, we, we're going to talk about is the animal robot. It's a quadrupedal robot developed by RSL, the Robotic Systems Lab at ATH. Uh, so we installed a torque controlled, non steerable wheels at the end of the legs. So it would become a, this hybrid robot. So previous work have shown the robot perform uh, separately, driving locomotion and legged locomotion and walking and stepping locomotion. And we also have previous work showing hybrid driving stepping locomotion. But in both cases, uh, the robot moves blindly in the terrain. So it's a reactive approach employing a flat terrain assumption and that it does include terrain information for the planning problem. So as we can see, we have a lot of locomotion approach that focus on statically stable locomotion. So locomotion at slow speeds in challenging terrain. And we have some frameworks that focus on dynamic motions, but using a flat terrain assumption. So the focus of this work was to bridge this gap uh, between dynamic locomotion and locomotion in rough terrain for wheeled legged robots by developing a motion planning framework that enables these kind of robots to negotiate rough terrain in a dynamic manner with dynamic motions. So this is possible because we take into account the terrain information. So we take into account the terrain map and the dynamics of the robot during the planning task. The approach is quite general for all terrain types and the robot space is not a constraint to any desired height or orientation. So it's a very general approach. And we are going to see that we've shown negotiation of steep slopes using purely driving motions and negotiation of discontinuous terrain using hybrid motions. So for discontinuous obstacles, you need to have instance of wheel lift off so we can actually overcome them. So you cannot do with driving motion alone. So we extend the approach to use discontinuous to deal with discontinuous obstacles by stepping and driving simultaneously at speeds over three times faster than previous approach for similar obstacles. Um, so we, for the trajectory optimization problem, we actually employ a direct uh, collocation technique where the continuous optimal control problem is transcribed into a nonlinear programming problem by discretizing over the decision variable over sample times along the trajectory. So, so we optimize over the state of the robot and also the control inputs. Um, and then the continuous motions are obtained by the interpolation of third order polynomials using Hermit parameterization, which is quite well known. So if you have the state and the derivative and each node, a third order polynomial is fully defined between these two points. 
Uh, so, well, planning hybrid locomotion for wheel legged robots is actually quite a challenging task because uh, similar to purely walking locomotion, uh, the wheel can either be in contact with terrain or not. The difference between these two types of motions is when we have wheels, so when we have hybrid locomotion, once the wheel is in contact of, with the terrain, it's allowed to move. So it's allowed to have non-zero velocity and acceleration while in contact. It is not true when you are planning to walk, right? When you are in contact, then you remain still. And with hybrid locomotion, you can actually use the wheels to drive while in contact, which makes the motion faster. Um, but we must include some different constraints here. In this case, these wheels are non steerable so we have to include uh, a constraint on the rolling direction of the wheels, so the motion is consistent with, is consistent with wheel locomotion. So these are kind of new constraints that have to be taken into account for this kind of robots. So, in, in, but in both cases, we have that the constraints that are applied on the wheels motions depend change, right? Depending on the contact state of the wheels. So we have different constraints, if the wheel is either in contact or not. So how do we handle this kind of formulation where we have different constraints depending on the state of the wheel? We use a phase-based parameterization. So we were firstly presented by Winkler in 2018, but for legged robots with point feet, not hybrid robots. So with this formulation, we can enforce phase specific constraints on each of the nodes. Uh, so for contact nodes, for, for contact phases, uh, the nodes are sampled at a fixed time interval along the trajectory. And because we have wheels, right? Because the contact point during contact phases can have non-zero velocity, both the contact forces and the contact positions are allowed to have non-zero values during contact phases. So they are fully optimized over, which is not the case for swing the phases or flight phases. When the wheel is not in contact with the terrain, there's no contact force. So all contact forces in all directions are fixed to a constant zero value and they are not even optimized over. They are fixed prior to the optimization, which speeds up computation a little. And as for the motion, a uh, different number of nodes can be used, but at least one, right? We need at least two polynomials in swing phases so the wheel can be lifted off and then lower back down. But for more complex obstacles, uh, you gain uh, speed in convergency if you had one more polynomial, so if you use three polynomials here. So this is an overview of the uh, trajectory optimization formulation. So the variables, the decision variables are the base position and orientation defined by Euler angles and the contact positions and contact forces of the wheels. So it is important here to comment that we optimize over the whole body motion in a single planning problem. So we optimize simultaneously for the base motion, the wheels motions, and the contact forces. Uh, as inputs, we have the initial state and the final and the desire, right? the goal state of the robot, uh, the, to the direction, the duration of the trajectory, and the contact schedule for the motion. So the contact schedule indicates the sequences and durations of each contact phase for all the wheels. Uh, this approach is quite generous, so we can handle both statically and, which is this case here, when we have one wheel lift off at a time, or it can handle dynamically stable gates, where you have multiple wheels lift off at the same time, even all of them. So because we employ this phase-based parameterization, we can enforce phase-specific constraints, right? Whether the wheel is in contact or not. So 
for the wheels that are in contact, we enforce, uh, we have five constraints. The first one is the terrain height. So uh, the age terrain here is the height map of the terrain in a way that if you give an X and Y coordinate, uh, coordinate you have the height of the terrain at this point so we want to make sure that the z the, the z coordinate of the wheels position is actually on the terrain uh, we also have to ensure a positive normal force we have also to take into account the torque limits on the wheel motors on, on the motors on the wheels uh, we have friction constraints so to prevent slippage, we enforce the friction cone. It's actually not quite a cone. So to linearize this constraint, this is actually very well used. We uh, use a pyramid rather than a cone here to make this constraint linear. And also we have one additional constraint that is specific for wheeled legged robots for hybrid robots, which is the rolling constraint on the wheels motions. So we have to make sure that the direction of the rolling, the direction of the velocity of the wheels uh, is consistent with wheel locomotion. Uh, well, when the wheel is not in contact, so we basically have zero forces and have to make sure the wheel is not in contact with the ground. Um, we plan for dynamic motion, so it's important that we take into account dynamic constraints while planning for the trajectories. So for the dynamic model, we use a single rigid body dynamics model in which the robots represented by a single rigid body with um, mass and inertia here at its center of mass. Uh, of course, this uh, relies strongly on the assumption that the base mass is higher, it's considerably higher than the legs mass, which is not, uh, it's, it's, it's a quite a good assumption. So in most wheel, most legged robots, the base is, it's up to three times uh, heavier than the legs. Um, uh, in here, we can make some additional comment. We have a lot of approach that use a linear inverted pendulum model, right? So uh, they, they compute the wheels positions and the base positions in different states of the planning problem. So rather than optimize contact forces, they optimize for the ZMP position uh, in a way that always lies within the support polygon formed by the contact positions. Uh, these approaches, even though it has a lot of work that uses it successfully, uh, it has a hard time uh, enforcing constraints on the contact forces. So another advantage, uh, in addition to the generality of the formulation, is when you optimize over the whole body in a single planning problem, is that you have, it's, it's easier to handle constraints in the contact forces on the wheels, right? Mm. Uh, as for kinematic constraints, also in efforts to linearize these constraints. So we have a feasible workspace that is located on a nominal position of the wheel with relation to the base and moves together with the base. So if the wheel contact position lies within this feasible workspace, then this position is valid. So once the motion planner computes the reference trajectories, they are tracked by a whole body controller that computes the actuation torques for the wheels and the joints at a 400 Hertz frequency loop. Uh, this whole body controller is actually a hierarchical framework. So it has several different tasks, inequality and equality tasks they are solved in a prioritized order. So the whole body controller tracks the trajectory while taking into account the full rigid body dynamics of the robot, torque limitations in friction con, and the non-holonomic rolling constraints uh, added by the wheels. Uh, well, for flat terrain, we have, I mean, it's questionable the use of hybrid motions 
but we have two uh, important scenarios here, which is lateral displacement and lateral displacement with change in the robot's heading direction. So in these cases, the robot doesn't need to stop. I mean, the wheels are non-steerable, but it doesn't need to stop to change direction or to perform lateral displacement, right? So you can perform these kind of trajectories in one fluid motion. In these cases, uh, we use a hybrid trot gait. Um, we have here the robot overcoming a gap with 0 0.25 meter with it, using a hybrid bouncing gait, and in which we move the front wheels together and then the hind wheel together at an average speed of 0 0.75 meter per second. So, Uh, and we, in here we have some plots uh, proving the successful tracking of the whole body controller. So the whole body controller was able to track these trajectories on a very realistic simulator with a tracking error of 20 millimeters in average. And here we have the same scenario, but with a different gate, with a hybrid dial-up gate. also at an average speed of 0 0.75 meter per second. So it moves first the left wheel, then the right, and then performs the same with the hind wheels. The error was a bit, a bit smaller in this case. And another scenario are floating steps. Floating steps are steps that are disconnected from the ground. So, uh, actually stepping motions are necessary. So this is a floating sap with 0 0.2 meter height, which is uh, around 40% of the length of the legs of this robot uh, at an average speed of 0 0.75 meter per second. So it's interesting to note that the robot starts lifting the wheels prior to the obstacle, which speeds up the maneuver. And it's only possible because we have prior knowledge of the terrain. We take into account the terrain map during the planning problem. Uh, a negotiation of a discontinuous obstacle, such as this one, using a hybrid locomotion at a 0 0.75 meter per second. I mean, not in a static uh, maneuver. It's, it's a very interesting result. Um, we can also handle asymmetric obstacles. So in this case, we place the same step in the right side of the robot with a goal that's straight ahead. So driving over the obstacle is not an option. The robot has actually to go over it. So we can design a specific gate for this kind of situations where the left wheels are allowed to remain in contact with the ground for the whole trajectory. So in this case, we have a tracking error of three millimeters, which is very, very small. Um, we have some experimental results with the actual robot negotiating steep slopes with 45 degrees angle and 65 degree angle at a 0 0.5 meter per second. Um, so as you can see in the video, there is an overlay of the simulation and then followed by the actual trajectory of the robot. Uh, and in here, we have the same obstacle that is actually overcame by a different trajectory. Instead of going both wheels at the same time, we go one wheel at a time. And here we have some, yeah, we have some additional comments to make. Uh, you may have noticed that in the optimization formulation, we do not use a cost function. So, what we do is that we solve a, a feasibility problem. So we set the constraints in a way that a trajectory that fulfills all the constraints is viable to be applied on the real robot. This speeds up the optimization considerably very much. Um, I mean, the downside is that you are highly prone to a local minima. And so uh, these approaches actually very sensitive to the initial solution provided to the solver. So what we do, it's very simple actually. Uh, the initial solution is a linear interpolation of a fixed time interval between the initial and the final position. 
where the velocity in all the nodes is the average velocity for the trajectory. So to uh, obtain these two different trajectories for the same obstacle, either both wheels at the same time or one wheel at a time, all we have to do is shift the positions of the left and the uh, right wheels uh, for a, a little during the initialization. And then it's enough for the silver to converge to a different trajectory. Uh, this one wheel at a time uh, is a little bit less torque consuming and it doesn't rely so much on the friction coefficient here on the slope wall. So these are yeah, two different trajectories for the same obstacles. And here we have a step with a, a more steep inclination, right? 65 degrees, either in the right side of the terrain path or or on the straight ahead of the robot. Mm. Here we have two other cases in simulation for driving motion. So uh, yeah, to perform driving motions in these formulations, all you have to do is to provide a, a contact schedule that is just one huge, one big contact phase, I mean, all the wheels in contact for the entire trajectory. So we have here a half pipe terrain with 0 0.5 meter deep it depth at an average speed of one meter per second. So we can actually see here that because we have terrain knowledge, uh, the robot presents a predictive behavior that allows them to overcome the obstacle in a faster way. So the robot starts already adjusting the base positions and the wheels position prior to the obstacle, similar to what we've seen for both the gap and the step and the floating step. Uh, and then we have here five consecutive steps. So it's similar to the step that we use in the experimental setup, 65 degrees slope at an average speed of 0 0.5 meter per second. Going up five stairs like this uh, with this speed is only possible because we, we take into account the theory information. Uh, so as conclusion, so we have presented here a trajectory optimization framework for wheel-legged robots that enables terrain-aware dynamic locomotion in challenging terrain. So we have shown negotiation of continuous and discontinuous obstacles with dynamic motion, so no quasi-static condition or static condition is assumed, and we take into account the, the dynamic how the motions in higher speed. So if taking into account dynamic um, effects on the motion and these trajectories are validated in a very realistic simulator actually that takes into account the full rigid body dynamics of the robot and runs the exact same controller embedded on the real platform in addition to some results using the same framework but proved on the real on experimental tests. Uh, there's also some future work. I mean, there's a lot of future work regarding this hybrid locomotion. So yeah, one of them is to include the contact schedule optimization, right? So um, we can add the phase durations and the sequences as decision variables in the nonlinear programming problem in a way that we also optimize the contact schedule along the trajectory, uh, these would probably increase considerably the computational cost. So some trade-off has to be analyzed for this kind of approach. And also something that's very interesting that's being currently carried out there at RSL, I'm actually helping a little, uh, is the implementation of the framework in a Resending Horizon fashion. So it can, so the trajectories can be adapted online to make them more robust to terrain uncertainties, for, for example. Um, so this concludes the part on wheel legged locomotion. So we can move on very quickly on the, on the work that I'm also doing now on the Research Center on Inspection Technology. So I was just talking earlier in the beginning uh, 
not just um, in Brazil and mostly in Rio, we have a very strong oil and gas in the areas so or have a very large state company. So there's a lot of a lot of research opportunities in this field, right? For oil and gas. So what we do here is we have research contracts, we have research, we perform research for different companies that they have some structure or some oil pipeline to inspect that are not standard in some way. They had to change the diameter or the material or um, it changed diameter. It has two different diameters along the pipeline to meet some requirements when they were being assembled. So for these kind of structures where there isn't an off-the-shelf tool to inspect them, we design an inspection system for these kind of structures, all the way from the mechanical design to the electronic systems, the instrumentation, the control system, and the interface with an operator. So it's, it's a very interesting work that we do here. Uh, in some cases, uh, we are just focusing on, on making the inspection more efficient. So I work in particular, I've been working in the last couple of years with uh, an inspection system called ARI, Autonomous Underwear Hyzer Inspection. So the hyzer is the vertical section of the oil pipeline that connects the oil rig to the seabed. So it's, it composed of several different layers where we have some polymatic layers and then we have some layers with enforced steel wires. So if any of these lower layers uh, of steel get in contact with seawater, it can uh, damage or weaken the structure of the pipeline. And this pipeline is actually subject to a lot of uh, fatigue and corrosion and collisions. So it's a critical, it's very critical to that this kind of pipelines need to be inspected regularly, right? So uh, for these, we have designed uh, an inspection tool that has this mechanical design here. So it has an opening point. So it can be either installed by an ROV with manipulators or by professional divers. So it, it opens here and then it gets installed around the pipeline and then it gets closed. The design, it's a bit larger because uh, it is, it, it was thought in a way that could carry different or any type of non-destructive technique for inspection. So it can be equipped with ultrasound, x-ray, ray geometry. Um, in this case, the current prototype we have, it uses full AG camera, LEDs and lasers. So it performs visual inspection for, of the outer surface, outer surface of the hazards. So, We have here a video of a, a test that we perform in a test in a very large test tank that we have, not at PUC, but at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So it's 25 meters deep. So as you can see, the tool is powered via an umbilical cable and it has two propellers, two thrusters. They're responsible for moving the tool along the pipeline and we have both a speed control system. Uh, we have two odometers and a pressure sensor to localize the robot. And then we have a speed control system to make sure the images doesn't get any blur and it moves constantly along the pipeline and can overcome eventual obstacles on it. And we also have a spin control because um, we have some floaters a lot around the robot to make it uh, so we can have positive buoyancy, right? It's a safe fit measure in case of electrical failure. So if you have a full electrical power down because the robot's positive, it will just move 
uh, upwards towards the surface, the surface of the water. Uh, but because it's, it's quite difficult to obtain perfect level view on so you're around the tool, so we can um, coil, you can spin around the pipeline, not a lot, a little, but over, you know, 300 meters, 500 meters, it starts to, these spins start to be big enough to coil the, the uh, umbilical cable around the pipeline. So we also have a compass and a spin control system. Um, so, yeah, the, the fact that the tool is positive in water makes it easier to install. So as we're going to see here, we have two professional divers able to install the system in less than a minute. So it's, it's quite easy. Of course, we are moving towards the, the last and last uh, application with professional divers and in human lives. So it's also, it, you can also install a handle at the door that can be operated by an ROV as well. And so where we have, a, a, so the design of the tool is robust in a way that can solve different inspection techniques. Right now we have a camera, full AD camera with a LED for illumination and a laser, a line laser that allow for sizing the defects on a pipe wall. And we also have uh, an adaptive suspension system. So we have some rollers that were specifically designed to overcome obstacles in the pipe wall. So as you can see here, we put some uh, fake obstacles, some simulated obstacles here. And there's also the connections, leaves that connect sections of the pipeline. And with this full AG camera, the video inspection quality is actually quite high. Yes, so this is it. This is all I had to talk about. So I'm open for any questions you guys may have. Fantastic. Thank you, Vivian, uh, for a fantastic talk with lots of very cool videos. So very much appreciated. Um, all right, let's open it up to questions from the audience. And I noticed, Ho, you had a question uh, at one point uh, pretty quickly into the talk. Did, was that addressed in a later slide? Yeah, so I think it was addressed later. That's fine. Um, perhaps I can get things rolling with the questions as the audience thinks there's up. So for the uh, riser inspection system, Vivian, you showed the video product that you're making. Um, how, how is it used? Is there a human involved in interpreting the video or do you uh, uh, envision building any more tools to interpret the video uh, in a more automated yeah, way? So Right now, uh, all the videos are stored in the robot and post analyzed by a, a certified inspector. So we, we, have, uh, we have developed an analysis software that actually, you can actually play the videos and it already uh, marks and it already overlay the video information with the odometry information in a way that you, when you identify, identify some corrosion or some defect on the pipeline, you actually already have size and position information. But this is all okay. post-analyzed. So you do, you do have uh, an automated way to flag issues for a human to go and look at later. Yes, yeah. uh, we, we do. And are you producing any 3D models out of it? Or is it strictly looking at the, the video with a human brain to figure out what's going on? Uh, so far, yeah, it just um, with the human uh, evaluating the videos. But because you have the laser line, so the idea to have the laser, it's all to enable 3D reconstruction. So it's not developed yet, but it's definitely a future work so we are working on it because it's, it's one thing to know where the, that defect is but it's important to have some sizing some dimension information uh to know how big it is you know how dangerous it is and with this line information this laser line we can actually 
uh, reconstruct the, the 3D profile of the pipeline. It's something that we're actually working for. Okay, fantastic. And uh, I suppose you're collecting as much data as possible so that you'll be able to. Uh, yes, we have. Uh, yeah. We don't have enough bandwidth to send the data I mean, up to the surface, of course, I mean, it's, mm. it's quite hard. So we have a very large AD embedded where we save as many information as possible, as much information as possible. Okay, very cool. Okay, um, Her has a question. He's typed into the chat window. Who do you want to unmute and ask the question yourself? Sort of putting you on the spot. I don't see any response from her, so I'll go ahead and, and ask for you. Um, so the question is, uh, Vivian, could you comment on the computational speed of the NLP? Yes. Um, uh, what we have now is an average, the computational cost for one trajectory. Uh, it's half of the time of the uh, horizon for the trajectory, for the duration. So, I, I mean, of course, in flat terrain, it's much faster. And then terrain is obstacle, but in average, what we see is that for a time horizon of two seconds, uh, it takes zero, around one second to compute the trajectory. This is actually uh, one of the, so to make this work online, when we're working with nonlinear programming problems, the computational cost is always a, a drawback, right? So we are working now with smarter initialization techniques. So mm -hmm. as I told you, because we don't have a cost function. So if we manage to give the solver a solution that it's very, uh, that is very close to a solution that fulfills all the constraints in the beginning. And this does, of course, doesn't take a lot of effort uh, we might be able to speed up this competition uh, considerably. So it, it seems to me like there, there to follow up on that, uh, there are two kinds of use cases for these things. In, in one scenario, you've got a robot out in a space it's never explored before. And in another, it's in some environment where it has been. And so I wonder, could you use solutions from prior visits to help initialize? Uh, solutions. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So because this this would be a, a very uh, good idea, actually, if you, if you already have previous knowledge and if you already, for the first time, then you can use some reactive, a slow speed approach, like moving slowly, getting to know the environments. So we can have a map and we can have some haptic information on the wheels so we can use this previous uh, trajectory as input for the one that's going to generate a more faster locomotion. Yeah, fantastic. So that, um, we'll get back to the audience in a second. I really want to ask this question. So you, you've just mentioned using the haptics to help map out, but uh, if you were to endow your, your system with sensing, what would, and I, by that I mean uh, 3D imaging, LiDAR or uh, RGBD cameras, what would be the most important uh, characteristics in that sensing uh, and I'm thinking about how far out should it be able to see and what kind of accuracy do you need out of it? Uh, okay, so um, we use for the trajectory optimization, so we use a grid map of the terrain, right? We use the height map of the terrain uh, and I did not work in the perception system because the locomotion framework for them were what's is quite large, but I just took the information that I need for the perception model. But um, so in one way that we can perform the trajectory so fast is that we have quite a, we can see the map, we can see the map ahead for a few meters. So nice. we would need something that could see you know, two, maybe three meters ahead. So we can have this kind of predictive behavior that allows the robot to already adjust the wheels position or maybe the base positions to increase traction in a way that could overcome the steps in a faster way. So right. we would need uh, something around, um, I'd say two, two and a half meters. So we can have a, a good feel of the field ahead. Sure. And I guess a common characteristic for anything except LIDAR is that as you get further away, uncertainty grows, uh, you know, noise creeps yeah. in, you get imaginary lumps and bumps in your data. 
uh, how sensitive is your uh, planning to and control right. to that kind of noise? Right now, very. <laughs> we don't have. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is not a good answer, but uh, because we don't have online adaptation, we only we plan the trajectory and then we track it. So terrain mm -hmm. uncertainties and even dynamic obstacles. If, if someone in the middle of the trajectory just moves the stuff, of course we have some uh, we have some tolerance there because we have a whole body controller and we have very fast actuators that run mm -hmm. in a 400 hit, hertz loop frequency. So it's, we can react quite fast, but if you change completely, I mean, the position of the step, it won't be able to go over it. So okay. uh, right, that's why the next step is to combine these offline trajectories with some online tracking systems that can update the policy, that can update the, the trajectories in a way that would be much more robust to uncertainties. Yeah, so there's there's adapting the plan, and then there's um, just being responsive to deviations from the plan in in the moment. I I understand the Cassie robot, for example, is pretty good at dealing with a step, even if you move it. But if you add just a few steps, it can't do it without some prior information. Um, so yeah, it's, this is pretty interesting. I wonder yes. how do you how do you see this going in the future? How are we going to uh, integrate external sensing adaptation to you know the sensors being wrong a lot of the time? How what's what's the right approach moving forward? Uh, so what we're working with right now is uh, is a model predictive control approach. So we have a combination having previously computed trajectory has been efficient in any in very in various ways right because you have yeah. this kind of predictive behavior that's beneficial but not in, not being able to use some reactive some proprioceptive sensing to reactive to uncertainties is also not a very not very good so the combination of an offline trajectory with a model predictive approach that mm -hmm. not only that tracks the trajectory, that tr tracks this trajectory reactive re in a reactive way to to variations in the terrain map would be the, the best case scenario. It starts to draw some strong analogies to global and local planning for terrain traversal, right? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Very, very interesting. Uh, I'm hogging the floor. Who's got some questions from the audience? Yeah, it's a quiet crowd this morning. There we are. Tedja, what have you got? Uh, hi, Vivian. Uh, I have a rather naive question. So when we have the uh, set of stairs, uh, what happens if the uh, width of the stair is smaller than the stride of uh, animal? So can it jump over multiple stairs? Uh, uh, so if you have the, you're talking about if you have the steps a, a bit farther from each other, right? A bit closer. Uh, a bit closer. Yeah, no, I don't think you would be able to jump both step, two steps at the same time. So that's why we test in a scenario where the wheel would fit between the steps in a way mm -hmm. that could overcome not one step at a time, because you can all, only go over the entire set of steps at this 0 0.5 meter per second. If you are right after you go up the first step, the hind wheels are already going up the next. So these, these kind of scenario would, uh, would really go badly if you, have, if you don't have a good accuracy in this distance. Yeah, because it would, it would uh, the errors in the tracking would build up in a way that would prevent the robot to go up. Thanks a lot. Okay, any more questions for our speaker while we've got her? I see we've approached the hour, but maybe time for one more. No, it's a quiet crowd today. Okay. Well, it must have been a very, very clear presentation. Uh, I certainly enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Vivian. It's been great having you here virtually. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity. And um, 
I can just write here my email. I mean, my email is already advertised on the talk, so you, you can feel free to send me an email anytime. And I'm always open to new discussions and ideas. Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much, Vivian. And for everyone, I will see you all again at our regular time next week at one o'clock. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye.